Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of What Does That Do? Today, we're going to be talking about logical, or bitwise, operators, and how they turn seemingly random characters into functional and potentially malicious code. In computer programming, a bitwise operator operates on a string of ones and zeros. The most common operators are not, and, or, and XOR, along with two different kinds of shifts, where you're moving the entire string either left or right. Not is pretty easy. All it does is turn any ones into zeros or any zeros into ones. And works on a bit string the same way that you would think it works when determining true or false. If two statements are true, you have a true result. If you have one true statement and one false statement, you get a false result. Similarly, if you have two false results, you have a false result. With bits, true and false are represented by one or zero. So if you have two strings with a one in the same position, the result is also a one. All of the other combinations result in a zero. Similarly, OR, as with true and false, only needs one of the bits to be a 1 in order for the result to be a 1. XOR is an exclusive OR, which means that it's looking for one and only one of the bits to be a 1. If you have two 1s, XOR says that's a 0. Now, to demonstrate what this looks like, why don't we use this Python program that I have here to illustrate what happens when you use the AND operator to combine the letter F and the letter A. Here we have the strings in ones and zeros for what F and A are, and we can see zero and zero is zero, one and one is one. Similarly, all of the rest are zero. And the net result is a string of 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, which happens to be the backtick. If we take a look at how the OR operation works, we can see that the net result is 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. And that's the letter G. If we take a look at what this does with the XOR, the exclusive OR operation, we can see that what we get are 0, 0 this time instead of the 1 that we got from pre previous runs, another 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. This adds up to 7, which turns out that it's not actually an ASCII character. This happens to be the Bell control character. Now, I had mentioned that there were three other operations that you could do on bits. One was the not operator, and all that does, as I said, was flip zeros to ones and ones to zeros. We can see how that works by testing it on the ASCII character 4. And what we end up with is 0 becomes 1, 0 becomes 1, 1 becomes 0, and so on. And we end up with a capital E with an umlaut. Now, if we take the next operator, the left shift, and we tell it to shift one bit over, what we end up with is it goes from ASCII 52 to ASCII 104, which is the H character. Similarly, if we shift it to the right, what we end up with is ASCII 26, which is the substitute control character. Now that we see how this works, why don't we take a look at an example that I've come across in my day-to-day -day work. Here we have a PHP script where it's taking the right square brace and a semicolon and using XOR on them. If we take a look at how that works, enclosing them in single quotes to protect the command line, we can see that this string turns into 0110110, which is the letter F. If we use a period and a caret, we get 0111. 0, 0, 0, 0, which turns into the letter P. And if we use the pipe and the pound symbols, 
we get 01011111, and that is the underscore. If we take a look at this in a little more readable format, we see that we have three variables getting set, and having gone ahead and done this, what we end up with is, is this is the letter F, this is the letter P, and this turns into get. The net result is that this function call here is actually get f get p, which is a remote code execution. So now that we understand that, we can take a look at some other more complicated examples. Here we have a line of relative garbage. We have a bunch of different strings and logical operators. Here we have an or, another or, a whole lot of or, and if we take these and run them through our program, we can see that it's using the OR. And so these are all six character strings. And so what we'll end up with is a long list of strings here. While this is working, we can see that the OR is working correctly. And the net result is another string. And if we look here, yep, we have this being used again over here. So if we take this string here and this string here and use the XOR operator this time, we get a whole different set of strings and it turns into this. If we take this new result, e at teb, and we combine it using the OR operator with our previous result, what we end up with is get env. So we know now that wmmcq here is get env. And so here we're doing an eval of get env and a concatenation of several other variables. Now that we know what some of these are, I'll just skip ahead and show you what they all resolve to. Here we have this first string just resolves to uh, set a random string here. This variable is not actually used. This variable here resolves to OU equals, which is then used down here. ZMH2 resolves to this string of characters, and ZMH2 is used down here at the end. ES8UED resolves to MF5. G6 resolves to HTT, then we have P and we have A, here we have HTTP, here is a bare string that doesn't seem to do anything, here we have underscore X underscore WA, here we have PIP, ADD, R, here we finally get that TQA is actually MD5, then we get WMMCQ is actually get ENV. And when we take a look at this long string here, we can see that it is doing a parenthetical operation here using XOR between two strings, and then it's doing another XOR here with two more strings, and then it's doing an OR of both of those results. And what you end up with is that string ORed with this string, which turns into an MD5 hash. And then if we take a look at the final if statement here, we have just a simple concatenation of variables and function calls, which turn out to be if the MD5 of the environment variable HTTPA is equal to this hash, then we do an eval on the contents of the environment variable HTTP underscore X underscore WAPIPADDR. Again, another type of eval. And there you have it. That is the most typical way in which malware samples, and in particular eval requests, get hidden in and obfuscated using bitwise operators. There you have it. Bitwise operators and how they can transform seemingly random code into fully functional and potentially malicious scripts. Thank you for watching. If you like what you saw, hit the like button.
If you have comments, questions, or want me to take a look at something, feel free to leave a comment in the comment section below. If you want to get updates for when new videos go live, please subscribe and have a nice day.